Glad you all could be with us to worship with us here at the Paris Church of Christ. We're thankful for those that's also tuned in. We pray that you'll soon be able to be with us and be back to normal real soon. Uh, we plan to resume Sunday a.m. Bible school class. Uh, that will be March the 7th. That's the first Sunday in March. So mark it on your calendars and pray that that can be uh, something we can initiate that we need very badly. So uh, don't forget that. Leadership meeting is scheduled for the 21st. That's on a Sunday of this month at 1.30. So uh, mark it also on your calendar. Those that we've been praying for, Leif Armstrong, Richard Cook, his address is in the foyer if you want to jot that down and maybe send him a card of encouragement. Opal Lips, Stanley McFarland, William Thorpe, Jim and Patty Welch, I think they're at home. Continue to pray for them. And Lita Latimer. Uh, she had uh, detached retina and she had surgery uh, just Friday or Saturday, Friday, I think it was. And she went through the surgery real well, but continued to pray for her that she can have a return eyesight to her. So that's uh, our daughter-in-law's mother. Is there anything that I maybe have missed? If not, uh, Henry Norris is going to come forward. And he's going to leave us this morning and sing it. Henry. One announcement I'd, I'd like to make is about the food pantry. Our numbers are really, really down in the food pantry. If you know of anyone that needs help, uh, pass it on to them and encourage them to come. We've got plenty of food to give away if you just come and pick it up. And a lot of people are laid off work, and we'll, we're willing to help them out also. So let them know that we are available. Our first selection this morning is 311 verses 1 and 2. 311 verses 1 and 2. <coughs> Everyone join in. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his and his riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be a king of a vast domain or be held 
of incense drifts away. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Next selection is 627. 627 verses 1 and 3. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way grow with clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land land way I'm in the glory land way I'm in the glory land way heaven is near and the way grow will clear for I'm in the glory land way <laughs> Next selection is 773, 773 verses 1 and 2. Soft as the voice of an angel, breathing a lesson unheard. Hope with a gentle persuasion whispering comforting words wait till the darkness is over wait till the tempest is done hope for the sunshine tomorrow after the showers are is gone, whispering oh, oh how well come the voice making my heart. In his sorrows rejoice. If in the dust of the twilight, then be the region afar. Will not the deepening darkness Bright in the glimmering star. Then when the night is upon us, Why should the heart sink away? When the dark midnight is over, Watch for the breaking of Whispering hope, oh how well come the voice making my heart 
in its sorrow rejoice. Our selection before the reading and prayer and the lesson is 670. 670 verses 1, 2, and 4. 670 verses 1, 2, 2 and 4. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting. There's a place that is wondrously fair. For he glows in the light of his presence. Tis the beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits as he opens the gates to the beautiful garden of prayer. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting, and I go with my burden and care. Just to learn from his lips words of comfort, in the beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits as he opens the gates to the beautiful garden of prayer. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting, and he bids you come meet with him there. Just to bow and receive a new blessing in the beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits as he opens the gate to the beautiful garden of prayer. Our song after the lesson is 272 verses 1, 2, and 3. 272. Reading this morning is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 10. Uh, I'll be reading verse uh, 14 through 18. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth of all that is in it. Yes, the Lord set his heart in, in love of, of your fathers and chose, chose their offspring after them. You above all people are, are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who is not partial and takes, takes no bribe. 
he executes justice for the fatherless and for the widow and he loves the sojourner and he gives gives him food and clothing to bow with me please our Heavenly Father we're thankful thee for this day we're thankful father for your great love for us and that love which was manifested in giving your son to die on the cross for our sins we're thankful father for uh, your holy and divine word which we have access to that we can read and study and know your will know how to guide our paths and that we might know how to uh, bring others to uh, you and your son as we uh, read your word and know what you'd have us to do we are thankful father for uh, the congregation that meets here at paris uh, for our elders and for their direction and oversight for the elders and the uh, various tasks in which they uh, provide for in service to the church. Uh, we're thankful, Father, for each member, each family that's represented. We pray, Father, that you would uh, bless us this morning as we endeavor to worship you in the spirit and the truth. Uh, help us, Father, to put away the things of our minds that concern us from day to day, that we might concentrate upon you and your word. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would be with Brother Clay this morning as he brings us a message. Uh, give him a ready rec recollection of those things which he's prepared to, to teach us. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would be with those who are mentioned uh, this morning and in our bulletin. Uh, those are on our hearts, both uh, church members and, and family and friends that are suffering. Uh, pray, Father, that you would be with each and be with the healing and process and uh, that they are undergoing and if it be your will that you would return them to their normal state of health We're so thankful father for the opportunity that we have to assemble here and, and in this great country of ours uh, without fear of molestment uh, we often take uh, for granted those things which uh, uh, we we have as uh, citizens of this great country uh, we pray father that you would be uh, with those who are uh, in foreign lands, uh, those who are serving in our military, uh, be with those who are uh, serving in the, the hospitals and the medical profession, uh, those that are uh, continue to, to battle this uh, pandemic that we are experiencing as a country and as as the world. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, you be with uh, be with our nation, uh, be with uh, uh, the world, as we. Uh, uh, hope and pray as as time continues that this this will too uh, pass and things will uh, uh, soon be a relief for us that we can go about our normal lives again and and be uh, as a result hopefully more faithful to be more appreciative of the things that we have uh, for these blessings we do ask in Christ's name Amen. Good morning. Welcome again to the services of the Parish Church of Christ. We are grateful to be together and worship our good God today. As we begin, let's quote our theme verse for the year from Psalm 77, 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. This year we've been remembering We've been thinking about the mighty acts and memorials of God recorded in Scripture. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to think about some forgotten people in the Bible. Forgotten people. If you want to go ahead and open up, we're going to be reading today from Genesis chapter 38 about Judah and Tamar. When my older sister was in high school, she was assigned a book to read that contained explicit material. And my mother happened to pick up this book and read it at home, and she was shocked to find the contents of this novel that had been assigned by a teacher. And she took her concerns to the teacher, and when that did not succeed, she took her concerns to the school administration and ultimately, a public debate raged about the material that was being assigned for reading to high school students. And one of the defenses that was offered by the faculty of the school was, 
the Bible contains explicit material. And because the Bible contains explicit material, Christians should not be offended when other literature contains explicit material as well. Now, while their argument falls short, it is true that the Bible does contain some explicit material. It has instances of precise, explicit language, and it contains mature themes. But this language and these themes are never used to excite the imagination or to indulge the flesh. They are used to teach the message that God has given by recounting in accurate detail historical events. Now I've said all of this to say that the passage of scripture we're considering today has often been ignored because it disturbs us. Some of the details in Genesis 38 are not what we would call topics for polite conversation. Numerous commentators have made it clear that this chapter is one that is not best suited for the pulpit. And so for that reason, I want to do two things today. First, when reading from Genesis chapter 38, I'm going to make some modifications to the text as it stands in the English Standard Version. These modifications are not based on Hebrew knowledge. They're made out of respect for the innocence of some of those who are in the audience because they're not quite ready for the discussion of some topics. Second of all, you may have noticed that I am using a manuscript this morning. That's not something that I prefer to do, but I want to be very precise with my language. I am not ashamed of the Word of God. Genesis 38 is part of the Bible because God intended for it to be there. We must free ourselves from the notion that the Bible only records exemplary people doing exemplary things. Sometimes the events that are recorded in the Bible stand as examples of what we should not do. Even more than that, the Bible is not about people, first and foremost. The Bible is about God. His interactions with faithful people and his interactions with faithless people teach us about him and therefore about our own walk with him. The Bible is God's story. And Genesis 38 is a chapter in that story. Now, in addition to the implicit, explicit, however you want to say it, nature of Genesis 38, this chapter also raises questions for us because it seems to interrupt the flow of the book of Genesis. If you read Genesis chapter 37, you are introduced to Joseph, and we learn about how Joseph is Jacob's favorite son. He gives him this this special coat, whether it was of many colors or of long sleeves or whatever it may be. He's Jacob's favorite son. He also receives dreams from God that announce that he is going to be in an exalted position over his brothers and even his parents. And understandably, his brothers don't like Jacob very much for these reasons. And when they have the opportunity, they sell him into slavery at the end of Genesis chapter 37. And just as we learn that Joseph has been sold into Egyptian slavery, we get this interruption, this episode of Judah and Tamar that seems as though it is not related to the life of Joseph. Well-known biblical scholars, especially authoritative voices in the 20th century like Gerhard von Rad say that Genesis 38 is completely unrelated to the rest of Genesis 37 through 50. Another reason as well that we might 
not appreciate Genesis 38 has to do with our lack of understanding of social and cultural structures that make it compelling. The practice of leveret marriage was common in the ancient Near East. And this practice said that when a man married, if he did not produce children before he died, it was the responsibility of his family to see that his name continued. So he would, his wife, his widow, would be given to his nearest living male relative. Sometimes this would be a brother, a cousin, and, and even in some cases, the deceased's father. Now this accomplished two things. First of all, it allowed the deceased's name to continue. Now, we might not see that as a very big deal, but in a social culture that was built on family and tribe and clan, it was extremely important that a man's name continue. But second of all, it did something for the widow. In the ancient Near Eastern world, a woman was wholly dependent upon the men in her life. As a young woman prior to marriage, she belonged to her father's household. He was responsible for her. When she married, she belonged to her husband's household. And if he died, she still belonged to her husband's household. And if she had a son, she was under his leadership. If she did not, however, her father-in-law had two choices. He could either give her in marriage to another male in the family to preserve his deceased son's name, or he could send her back to her father, releasing her to remarry, but forfeiting the continuation of his son's name. Now, all of that may sound a bit complex or even bizarre to us because we have different expectations culturally for the role of women, for the, the understanding of marriage, and even for the importance of the continuation of a family name. And because of this, we have to take a little bit more time to process the events of Genesis 38 and all that, it, that they involve. Now, that's a lot to take in before we read the text. But let's turn now to Genesis 38 and read verses 1 through 11 and note again that the version that you have in front of you in your Bible may differ slightly from what I'm going to read out loud. Genesis 38, beginning at verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kazib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would make sure that she would not get pregnant so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah my son grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Now we're introduced to a number of different people in this chapter, but it's really about two people. One is Judah, who has already been introduced in the book of Genesis. In chapter 37, verse 26, Judah is the brother of Joseph who comes up with the idea of selling Joseph into slavery. Now, he doesn't offer this idea because he has compassion on Joseph, but because it is most convenient and advantageous for himself. He gets rid of his obnoxious brother, he makes a little money in the process, and he doesn't have to commit murder. 
So we see a, a deceiver and a cheat in Judah. We learn in the opening verses of chapter 38 that Judah has become quite comfortable with his pagan neighbors and even marries a Canaanite woman. And while the law of Moses does not yet exist in Judah's day, his behavior runs counter to that of his forefathers. In Genesis 24, verses 1 through 4, Abraham takes special measures to ensure that Isaac does not marry someone from the land of Canaan. Isaac and Rebekah are despise the fact that Esau marries foreign women. We see that in Genesis 26, 34, and 35, Genesis 27, verse 46, and again in Genesis 28, 8, and 9. And they too take special measures to make sure that Jacob does not marry someone from the land of Canaan, sending him to Laban's household, according to Genesis 28, 1 and 2. Judah's actions demonstrate a lack of respect for his father's family and its traditions. We're also introduced to Tamar, and we don't know very much about her. We know that her name means palm tree, and she is likely a Canaanite. Up to this point, she is quite passive, showing no resistance to her place in the societal order Instead, she complies with the cultural expectations of her situation. Unfortunately for Tamar, her first husband, Ur, and her second husband, Onan, are so wicked that God puts them to death. Her second husband, Onan, used his leveret marriage to her solely for his own gratification, intentionally leaving her childless. In spite of her tragedies, Judah deceives Tamar, claiming that she will have another opportunity to fulfill her role in society when Sheila reaches marriageable age. Do you feel Tamar's anguish like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel before her? She is left without a child knowing that that was her primary role in society. We may not agree with the societal and cultural expectations of her day, but for her, this was a great disappointment. She has no place in society without having a child. But her story isn't over yet. Let's continue reading. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, Your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Aniam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought that she was a woman for hire, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Now the story has shifted. Judah, the schemer and deceiver, falls prey to Tamar's scheme and deceit. Her plan was well constructed. The time of sheep shearing was one of festivity that involved partying and drunkenness. Furthermore, Judah was widowed and thus more susceptible to the temptation that Tamar presented to him. Yet Tamar's actions were born of desperation and carried with them great risk. If she had been recognized, her punishment would have been the death penalty, whatever her intentions may have been. Now something you may notice, as we've read now 19 verses in this chapter, is that God has only been mentioned twice. In verse 7, 
when he punished Ur with death, and in verse 10, when he punished Onan with death. God does not appear to Tamar to reassure her, to tell her that she's going to have children, to offer her any promise or hope. Now, Tamar's actions disturb us. Even if we acknowledge her dilemma, we find it hard to respect her methods. If we're reading carefully, however, we ought to be disturbed by Judah's actions as well, and not just the fact that he hired Tamar. Even before that, Judah abused his power over Tamar. By lying to her about Sheila, he forced her into a no-win situation. She was widowed in her father's house, but had no right to remarry because technically she still belonged to her dead husband's family. She was at a dead end through no fault of her own. What offends us more? What offends us more? Tamar's deceitful acts, through which she actually maintained the cultural practices of her day by way of leveret marriage, or Judah's intentional abuse of power, by which he not only rejected the cultural expectations of his day, but also rejected the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What offends us more? Think about that for a moment. Then let's read what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In a society where the man is responsible for the woman, his actions have implications not only for himself, but also for those who are under his charge. Now comes the moment of truth. The first part of Tamar's plan was successful. But what will happen when her father-in-law Judah learns of her condition? He is responsible for her, and he will have to judge her. Genesis 20, uh, 38, beginning at verse 20. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, Where is the cult woman for hire, who is at Anayim at the roadside? And they said, No cult woman for hire has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No cult woman for hire has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things for herself, or we will be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not know her again. Do you find yourself surprised by Judah's admission? What had Judah really done? He refused to give his son, Sheila, to Tamar for fear that she was a cursed woman for fear that he would be left completely childless in a culture that placed utmost value on the continuation of a family. While we may see that his course of action was not according to custom, he had not received a word from God requiring him to give Tamar to Sheila. Most of us make our decisions in life on the basis 
of a number of different variables. We consider risk. We look at possible outcomes. We consider social, moral, and ethical lines and whether they are worth crossing in order to achieve our preferred outcome. Like Judah, we are not immune to fear. Whether we want it to or not, fear often plays a role in our decision-making process. No doubt, Tamar was afraid as well. She took a great personal risk. But in her case, fear did not keep Tamar from acting in a way that allowed her to fulfill her social and cultural responsibility. But even more than that, what Tamar may not have known was that she was perpetuating the promises of God. In this way, Tamar is actually a bit like Joseph. Just like Judah had done with Joseph, he forced Tamar into a degrading situation because he felt that it was most convenient for himself. Just as Joseph would later put on a costume and receive a symbol of power, that is, putting on the Egyptian garb and receiving the Pharaoh's signet, Genesis 41, 42. So also Tamar put on a costume and received a symbol of power, Judah's signet. Finally, just as Joseph could say in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So also Tamar became God's chosen vessel. She acts in a manner that not only keeps the tribe of Judah alive, but also leads to some of its most important members. Listen to how the chapter closes. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took, and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. Perez, by virtue of the Leveret custom, is considered the son of and heir of Ur. According to Ruth 4, 18-22, King David descended directly from Paris. Yet there is another from the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5, 5, who also descends from Tamar and Perez. According to Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, Tamar and Perez are in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 38 disturbs us, and it should, but not just because it contains language that we might consider impolite. It should disturb us because all too often, we are like Judah. We take advantage of what little power we have, and we use it for our own personal comfort. We allow fear to dictate our actions, even when it means betraying those who ought to be able to rely on us. And last but not least, we put our trust in our judgment, and our abilities, rather than in the promises of God. And all of these are in opposition to the gospel. In the gospel, we learn that our aim in this life is not our personal comfort. The gospel calls us to discomfort, to bearing the cross while despising the shame. Jesus refused to use his power for his own personal comfort. Instead, he used everything that he had to plead the cause 
of mercy, justice, and faithfulness, humbling the powerful and exalting the humble. He surrendered himself to suffer rather than exercising his power. We sing that hymn. He could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus did not use power for personal comfort. In the gospel, we also learn that fear leads to death, but faith leads to life. When Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee with the disciples in the middle of the storm, he questioned them sternly in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? If Jesus had allowed fear to be his overriding motivator, he would have never gone to the cross and become our source of hope and life. Finally, in the gospel, we learn that we must wholly depend upon God and not upon our abilities. Without the promises of God, we would be entirely hopeless. Nothing we can do without, apart from God, can span the gulf of sin and imperfection that stands between God and us. Yet God has provided us with a bridge in Jesus Christ. And he gives us the, the opportunity to cross that bridge and in so doing take hold of the promises that he offers we will either be a Judah or a Tamar. When we choose the path of Judah, we reject the promises of God. When we choose the path of Tamar, we may find ourselves unwanted and unloved by those in positions of power, but loved and chosen and heirs of the promises of God. Will you be a Judah or a Tamar? If you want to be a Tamar, you've got to hope in the promises of God. And to do that this morning means to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that he is the one whom God sent to create that bridge between us and God. And believing that he is the Christ, turn away from your life of sin and confess the name of Jesus. We'll baptize you today for the forgiveness of sins and you'll rise up a new person, an heir of God's promises. If you're already a child of God and you find that lately you've been following the path of Judah, allowing fear and personal comfort to override your faith in the promises of God, or if you simply need prayers and encouragement this morning, we're going to sing an invitation song. Please indicate in some way that you'd like to respond as we sing this hymn together. I have been to follow Jesus. I have been to follow Jesus. I have been to follow Jesus. No burning land, no burning land. No burning land. I still will follow. No burning I still Sixteen verses one and two. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, 
Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelled among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, one day they led him up Calvary's mountain, one day they nailed him to die on the tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he, living he loved me, Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. In the 46th chapter of Psalm, the author quoted the Lord saying, Be still and know that I am God. At no time could a request be properly applied or better applied than today. As we're in the presence of God, let us agree to be still. Understand the sacrifice that Christ has made on our behalf. And examine us in regards to the emblem that we're about to take. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity it is to approach your throne. We're thankful to be in your presence. We're thankful, Father, for our Savior, your Son. We're thankful for his willingness to die on the cross on our behalf. As we partake, Father, of this loaf, help us to understand what it is to be a part of the body of Christ. Help us to understand what it is when we partake of this loaf and the emblem that it means to you. These things have been asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us and the opportunity we have to come to this morning take this food of the night. To a Christian represents the blood of our Lord and Savior who died on the cross for our sins. May each and every one of us take it this morning, do this, and it may be well pleasing in your eyes. This we ask your Son's name. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in sight. Jesus loves the little 
of children of the world. Just a reminder that the offering plates are in the foyer as you leave. You can place your contribution in those. I pray for each and one of y'all. Have a good week this week. Stay healthy. And you come back and see us at the next appointed time. Any other announcements that needs to be made? Please bow and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, which art in heaven, we're thankful, God, for this day. It is a privilege to come into the house of you and to worship you in truth and in spirit. We realize, God, how fragile we are, how dependent we are upon you. We're thankful, Father, for your word, which instructs us and helps us to understand you better. Help us, Lord, to apply what we know to our, to our lives that we can better serve you as an instrument to do your will. We're mindful of our country and the COVID that's in our nation today. We realize, God, this is a temporary thing, that you're in charge. We turn to you, God, to lead, guide, and direct our lives. Help us to live a life, and all we say and do will bring your honor and bring your glory and bring encouragement to our fellow men. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity we have each day to serve you. Realize our choices, Lord, determines the way that we'll spend eternity. We pray, Father, that you'll go with each one of us. We remember those that's been mentioned on our prayer list. We pray, Father, that you would meet their needs. Help us, Lord, to put our full trust and obedience in you. Help our light to shine this week. We love you, Lord, and we we pray that it will reflect in the way that we live. Ask you to forgive our sins. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.